Next uh, is Gilad Lotan. He's the chief data scientist at Betaworks, a technology company that operates as a studio building new products, growing companies, and seeding investing. And he also previously ran the data team at Social Flow and built visualizations at Microsoft Fuse Labs. And he's going to talk about algorithms and human editors. <laughs> great. Uh, it's great to be here, so thanks for having me. Um, so my job is, as the chief data scientist at Betaworks is to really think hard about what we do with our data, uh, especially around productizing it. Uh, so I'll just give you a little bit of context around Betaworks. Uh, we're kind of a unique beast in the technology space. We're a startup studio, but we're not like your typical incubator. There's no like set amount of time that companies launch out of uh, Betaworks. We are very well known for our investments, so we invest in a whole slew of um, Early, very early stage companies. We were one of the first to invest in Kickstarter and Tumblr, uh, and there are over 100 companies out there that we've invested in. But the majority of people at Betaworks focus on building product, right? Most people at Betaworks are builders. Uh, and there are about 13 companies currently incubated at Betaworks. Uh, the focus is, is mainly media, but not only. Uh, but how do you define media these days, right? So we have a very successful games, casual games company called Dots. Uh, we have sort of a, an online uh, media portal called Dig, uh, Instapaper, Read It Later app. So, and we have a weather app, a very popular weather app, personalized weather app. So they're all sort of takes on media, uh, very sort of very different versions for what you would typically see in, I think, a media company. So at Betaworks, we keep uh, companies for a while, and sometimes they launch out, sometimes they stay for a long time. Uh, and we also think a lot about these shared resources. So what I do as, a, as uh, someone who leads the data science team is constantly uh, uh, be in touch with the different companies and figure out what are their uh, problems around data. So how can we help these companies grow uh, quickly using their data? And then uh, what can we do, what new things can we do uh, with external data sources or internal data sources that we have? How can we launch new companies out of this? Um, so we're constantly thinking uh, through the frame of products. And I want to give you a few examples uh, of, of how we use data, uh, especially this, this interesting space uh, where human editors meet uh, algorithms, where I think there's a lot that could be done. Um, so one of the companies that I'll talk about is Poncho. We were briefly, it's a personalized weather service. Uh, it's very simple. So what it does is it sends you a daily message or twice a day message about the weather. But it's, it's sort of designed to, to be, it's like the message your mom would have sent you. So there's no numbers, no charts, right? It's just like what you need, if you need a sweater or not, uh, if you need to take an umbrella, and something about your commute, right? So it's personalized to you and your needs that day. Uh, and it started as, like literally a, a person getting up in the morning, looking outside, kind of doing some searches online, and then sending out message to all the members in New York City. Uh, and obviously that doesn't really scale, right? Um, we, I mean, it did well in New York, and then we launched, launched in Boston, but uh, we're trying to figure out, okay, so how do we actually scale this service and keep it sort of really fun, quirky? It's, they're typically GIFs in your messages and jokes. Uh, right, so you can't automate the text part, and, and that's what people love about this product. Uh, but what we did was start pulling in all this uh, weather data uh, from different publicly available services as well as uh, uh, not like private services that had sort of aggregate uh, data about the weather. And we started running, uh, uh, running various algorithms on it. So we're trying to identify regions in, in the United States where uh, which displayed similar weather patterns that moment, right, and within the next few hours. So we're constantly, instead of sort of multicasting and sending a message that an editor writes from one region to that region, we're thinking, what other regions display similar weather patterns and are culturally similar enough? Uh, so taking sort of human editorial judgment, feeding that into our clustering algorithm, and then having editors sort of write the messages to regions instead of you know, specific zip codes. So using data and using this you know, effectively math uh, with inputs from editors and then with editors every day, we could actually scale the service so that uh, in order to cover all of New York State, uh, we, need, we can you know, have one editor writing 10 messages that more or less fit 
the whole of New York State. Uh, if we took taken into account every zip code, uh, you know, differently, we we could never at scale that service. So that's sort of one way in which we use data, uh, sort of this underlying layer of data to power this very sort of cute service that nobody, I think, and no no user has any idea that this is the underlying mechanism. But it's a way for it to, for us to scale the product and reach more people. Uh, so that's sort of one way and one unique way in which uh, uh, we saw sort of very true uh, uh, ways in which data was helping uh, products grow fast and sm power small teams. Um, the other thing which I think is very interesting is, is what we do with Dig. So if any of you have uh, gone to Dig in the last uh, you know, year and a half, it's completely different. Right? So it's effectively become this portal for what's happening on the internet. Right, the news for just new things. Uh, and it's tailored for a certain type of audience, probably male, 30 plus years old. Uh, but um, it's seen, it's, it, the editors, it's, it's effectively powered by editors, where the old dig used to be powered by a community, uh, very much like Reddit. Uh, so editors are constantly you know, online. They're trying to figure out, OK, what's the new, what's the new thing that's happening? What, what should be reported on dig? Uh, and we have various tools that help them identify that. And a lot of what we do is look at just a variety of signals uh, online uh, where a lot of them are public. So a lot of the signals coming from Twitter, from Facebook public pages, uh, things that are uh, posted on Reddit, right? Any of these forums where we can take different, uh, uh, especially social signals, and identify deviations from the norm. So we could say, well, for a New York Times article, this is doing really well given the amount of time you know, between publication and you know, now. So we're constantly looking at all these articles that are published uh, and assessing sort of the value uh, in terms of these signals that we're getting, very public signals, along with our internal signals. Uh, so we have a variety of signals internally where we're looking at you know, not only what's being published, but also what's being read and what's being shared. Right? So taking these three things building a model that then tells you uh, what is doing exceptionally well uh, for this domain, for this amount of time uh, to be published, and then helping sort of feeding that internally to the editors. So giving them the ability to scour the web and sort of then sort of only look at uh, uh, you know, a variety of chosen articles versus just you know, seeing everything. So they rely on some of these systems and now sort of use them to effectively find content at very early points of time, and then highlight them on dig. So we, we constantly think about this intersection uh, of how do we use technology, especially data, uh, which is what I do, to power these uh, editorial decisions. Uh, one thing, and I'll, I'll just close by talking about this thing that we're working on now, uh, is we're thinking about different ways to rank and score content where I think it's, it's typically, um, uh, it's very common for companies to highlight you know, the most trending piece of content or most popular piece of content, be it you can define these concepts very differently, right? If you're Twitter, it's one way. If you're Facebook, it's one, it's one way. And if you're the New York Times, it's completely different. But we're thinking about a variety, like various different scores. So what would a diversity metric look like? So I don't want to look at the most popular content, but I want to look at content that's being consumed and shared by a diverse audience, right? And using a lot of public signals uh, that are available now from social media, we can do that. Uh, so I'll just leave you with that, uh, and we can get back to any of these ideas. Great. Thank you. Thank you.